of my uh, recent works regarding the implicit bias of optimization algorithms for uh, neural networks. And we'll take two different perspectives, static and dynamic perspectives to solve, to answer different questions. So let me first um, introduce the, um, the situation of our um, problems. So um, we will study the optimization behavior for machine learning models in overprime price regime. But what's the difference of overprime price regime with the like traditional underprime price regime? Let's see some illustration here. For example, traditionally, if I have um, these five data points here on the two-dimensional uh, plane, and I want to use a linear regression to fit these data points, then um, the fitting line is a straight line. And this line has two unknown parameters because we can write y equals to ax plus b very uh, standard. And in this case, if we want to uh, use an optimization algorithm to find the minimum of the loss function, then the picture is pretty simple because the loss function is just a quadratic function and the task of the optimization algorithm is just to find the unique minimizer of that quadratic function. Well, of course, in practice, it is not always necessary to use an optimization algorithm. We can use other methods, but let's say we'll use algorithm. But uh, the picture is different if we use an overparameterized model, for example, a large neural networks. Then um, there are multiple different ways that the network can perfectly fit these five data points. If the network is large enough, this, if the number of data uh, parameter is larger than the number of data. And if we consider the uh, parameter space, the loss function in the parameter space, then we will see that all these different fittings will correspond to one global minimum in the parameter space, like the illustration I show here on the bottom. Of course, this is just a two-dimensional illustration, but we can see that there might be three uh, different global minimum corresponding to the three lines here, fitting all the uh, five data points. And in this case, um, the task for optimization algorithm is more uh, complicated because it not only needs to uh, pick a global minimum, but also it needs to pick good global minimum in the sense of generalization. Because, well, here we have three lines, but some line may generalize well and some may generalize badly. So we have to pick the good ones um, for the model to have good performance. And in the reality, the picture is, again, a little bit different. We don't have isolated global minimum. Instead, we have manifold of minimum because um, in over prime price regime, actually, the global minimum are those parameters that satisfy a set of equations given by training data. So uh, the solution set of these equations under some conditions can be shown to be, uh, to be continuous or smooth manifolds. So our global minimum form manifolds. And each point on this manifold corresponds to a line here um, that can perfectly fit the five, uh, the five data points. And along, going along this manifold, actually, we have a continuum of functions, uh, model functions that can perfectly fit the data point. So this is the case that we study. Uh, in this case, we have some new challenges. First, for example, we have more than one global minimum, and this minima can form a manifold. So only studying the convergence of the optimization algorithm is not enough, and we need to uh, we need the optimization algorithm to converge to a good minima, in the sense of the generalization. And this is pretty hard because uh, the algorithm doesn't know the test performance; it only knows the training performance. So our question is. Firstly, how can algorithm pick good minima among many, among many bad ones? And the second is, if there is a minima manifold, is there a sort of exploration of algorithms along this manifold? If yes, what can we, how can we describe these explorations? So we'll take two different perspectives. Firstly, uh, firstly, we will take a static perspective and study the minima selection effect of algorithms via linear stability theory. And we show that SGD prefers flat and uniform minima. And we take a deeper look of um, the implication of flat minima. And we show that those flat and uniform minima uh, generalize better because they tend to lead to smooth model functions. And then later, to answer the second question on the left side, we take a dynamical perspective and study the optimization algorithms motion along the minima manifold. And we derive manifold dynamics, that is an effective dynamics of these algorithms along the minima manifold. 
using some um, quasi-static approaches, which I will introduce in detail later. And we use this manifold dynamics to compare different algorithms like SGD and Atom. And we also use the result to explain some uh, observations like the edge of stability. So yeah, this is um, a framework. So let's start from the first part, the um, global minimum selection effect of different algorithms. Let's first see this effect. It exists in practice, for example, as shown by the numerical experiment here, we use a convolutional neural network to train a vision, uh, a vision data set. We start from a full batch gradient descent. Um, the training accuracy, the training accuracy is shown on the left panel by this uh, blue line. So at first we start from some random initialization and we run full batch gradient descent until it arrives at somewhere very close to 100% training accuracy. That means it is very close to a global minimum. And at this point, we suddenly switch the algorithm from GD to SGD, and stochastic gradient descent with a mini batch. And what we see is we, we see a sharp drop of the training accuracy so very quickly. And then the training accuracy gradually come back to close to 100%. And if we look at the test accuracy, we will see that there is also a sharp drop on the test accuracy and later it's come back and it's come back to somewhere that is higher than the test accuracy found by gradient descent finally. So these two pictures tell us the following messages. The first is um, SGD escapes quickly from the minimum picked by gradient descent. That is when we switch the algorithm, the iterator quickly escapes. It does not stay in the basin of this minimum. And the second is later SGD converge to a different minimum because we can see that it has different test accuracy. So this means SGD is selecting global minimum. It is not picking the minimum that's picked by the gradient descent. It is picking a new one. So why can this happen? Let's try to build some intuition on uh, very simple cases. Let's first consider a gradient descent. If we use a gradient descent to uh, optimize a function with multiple minimum, is there some sort of mechanism can allow the gradient descent to pick a subset of minimum while ignoring the others? Let's consider this uh, one dimensional function. We have two minimum here. We have a flatter one on the left. We have the, uh, a sharper one on the right. And these are both global minimum have the same value. Um, we can build our intuition by considering the stability of the gradient descent iteration around the minimum. We know that uh, when the loss function or the objective function is smooth, we can use quadratic functions to um, locally approximate the function around the minimum. For example, if we say that at the left minimum, the shape, the curve of the, the shape of the curve is similar to fx equals to ax square, and on the right side, it's like bx square. Of course, a is smaller than b because the left minimum is uh, flatter than the right one. Then how can we make the gradient descent pick one of such a minimum while we ignore the other? Um, the one approach is very simple. We just pick an appropriate learning rate. To see this, consider if we use a gradient descent with learning rate eta to minimize a quadratic function, let's say ax squared, then we have a criterion. We have a criterion for um, the learning rate that is, um, I think, one over a, right? If the eta is greater than one over a, then the gradient descent will blow up. If the eta is smaller than one over a, then it will converge to the minimum. That is just because when the learning rate is larger than that criterion, the algorithm is unstable uh, around this quadratic well. So here, since we have two different minima, ax squared and bx squared, and we just need to pick an eta that is smaller than one over a, but larger than one over b, then this gradient descent will become stable on the, um, around the left minimum while unstable around the right minimum. Then in this case, the gradient descent has a minimum selection um, effect because as long as it converges, it must converge to the minimum on the left and it will never converge to the minimum on the right. And similar things also happen for SGD, but here we have a more complicated picture. For SGD, let's consider we have a loss function given by the average of n component functions, f1 to fn. In the machine learning uh, situation, we can understand these, each fi to be, a function, to be a loss function given by one training data. 
And in this case, even if we have two global minimum of the total loss F and the curvature of F at the two minimum uh, are exactly the same, these two minima can still be different. That is because the terms that forming the F can behave differently around these two minima. For example, here we have a blue curve showing the, uh, the loss function and these red curves showing the component functions F1 and F2. Even if we have uh, these two global minimum that are uh, have the same curvature, the left one is more uniform if we consider uh, the, the curves of F1 and F2, while the right one is less uniform because F1 and F2 are pretty different. And this can make a difference. In this case, if we pick an appropriate learning rate, SGD may be stable for the more uniform minimum while unstable for the less uniform one. So this means for SGD, we can do the same um, linear stability discussion, but we have to consider more factors like the uniformity of the component functions uh, besides the just the, the sharpness of the minimum. Okay, and after the intuition, we can try to write this into uh, some mathematical theory. We wanna do a linear stability analysis for the algorithms here, specifically for the SGD around some global minimum. So we'll start from linearizing the dynamics. Consider a loss function given by um, the average of n components and each component is given by a square loss here. Um, W is the parameter and X, I, Y, I are training data and we consider a model F uh, with parameter W and we consider a square loss for each training data. And um, if we consider an SGD with learning rate eta and batch size B, then its iteration scheme is like this. Every step, we just randomly pick a batch of B uh, components and we take a gradient for those functions and uh, make an update along that direction. And let's linearize this dynamics at some global minimum W star. So if we have, if we suppose W star is a global minimum with zero loss, so actually it is an interpolation solution. The loss is exactly zero. Each component is zero, right? So around this W star, we can uh, expand, we can linearize dynamics in this way. We can obtain a uh, linearized dynamics. This is dynamics for WT tilde here. I add a tilde here to highlight that it is actually a different parameter, different variable than the parameter W there because that W is given by SGD. This is given by a linearized SGD around W star. And this H, each H is the Hessian of the loss LI at, uh, at W star. So this is a linear because every time you just multiply matrix on W T tilde. So this dynamics is pretty uh, different. It's much simpler than the SGD above, but it can characterize the behavior of SGD around W star. Specifically um, for the SGD to be stable around W star, that means if the SGD can converge to W star, then this linearized dynamics should also converge to W star. So we can study the stability of this linearized dynamics by the following definition. We say that W star is linearly stable for SGD with learning rate eta and batch size B if the variable of this linearized dynamics, WT tilde, will not get big on expectation compared with W0 tilde, compared with any of its initialization. So this is a pretty standard definition of linear stability. And with this definition, we can get the following theorem. We need two quantities here. The first is H, which is the uh, full Hessian matrix of the total loss function. And the other is a matrix sigma, which is like a um, variance of the Hessian of uh, each, each component loss function. So it is like a variance, but it is a matrix. And our theorem says W star is linearly stable for SGD with learning rate eta and batch size B if the uh, largest eigenvalue of this matrix is upper bounded by one. So we can see that um, here we have two terms. The second term is a term related with sigma. If we don't consider the second term, then the first term just to give us the uh, stability criterion for the gradient descent, right? So because sigma can be shown to be positive definite, uh, semi-definite actually, um, SGD actually makes linear stability, linear stability harder. 
<clears throat> but we'll try to interpret this um, readout and try to visualize it in a uh, in a simpler way. So we'll consider relaxing this readout and uh, uh, relaxing it into a set of condition on two scalars. Here we'll define two scalars. The first is called the sharpness, which is just the maximum eigenvalue of the Hessian, which is uh, widely used for gradient descent, of course. And the second is called the non-uniformity, which is the uh, maximum eigenvalue of the square root of sigma. This quantity characterizes how uniform our component functions are at the global minimum. By relaxing the condition above given by the theorem, we get the following two conditions on the sharpness and non-uniformity. We show that the sharpness lies between this interval from 0 to 2 over eta and s from 0 to uh, this quantity computed by eta, uh, the linear weight batch size, and n, the total number of data. And if we consider a diagram of uh, sharpness a and non-uniformed s, these conditions will give us rectangular regions on this diagram. We call this the sharpness non-uniformity diagram. And for each specific eta and b, we'll have a rectangular region. And note that for each global minimum of the loss function, actually, we actually this global minimum has a corresponding uh, sharpness and non-uniformity, so it has a corresponding point on this diagram. And the global minimum selection effect of SGD says that only when this corresponding point lie within the rectangular region described by the condition above can SGD select that global minimum. Otherwise, even if, the even if the global minimum is global, um, SGD cannot converge to that minimum. So that is how uh, the global minimum, minimum selection effect um, figured out by the, uh, by the linear stability analysis. Okay, so in practice, uh, is that true? And we did some numerical experiments. Firstly, we trained a gradient descent with different learning rates. And um, we use a convolutional neural network to learn different vision data sets. And we know that for a GD, we don't have a batch size issue. And for each linear rate, we have an upper bound for the sharpness found by the gradient, uh, found by the gradient descent. That sharpness upper bound is just a two over eta, the simple uh, upper bound. <laughs> and we repeated several experiments on um, different linear rate, and, and we see that the sharpness of the global minima found by our gradient descent, they all lie below the upper bound predicted by our theory. And what is more interesting is if you look at uh, the readout with those larger learning rates here, these sharpness found by ex experiments, they are very close to the upper bound of, uh, predicted by our theory, like 39 point something compared with 40. And that is very interesting that um, uh, an early observation of the edge of stability phenomenon, which I will uh, talk more later. And what about the SGD? For the SGD, if we uh, fix the learning rate but change the batch size, we'll have a different upper bound for the non-uniformity. And we did uh, different experiments, and they all show that gradient uh, global minimum found by SGD uh, has non-uniformity um, approximately upper bounded by these bounds given by the theory. There are some of, like, there are some points like a slightly up, uh, above the prediction and uh, that may also um, be the reason of the edge of stability. So Chow, Chow can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. This is very interesting. So, go, so just, just for instance, for, for the gradient descent case, right? If if mm -hmm. if you say does this depend on the initialization? Because I was thinking, I'm na naively thinking about it. If you initialize at some kind of a based on the attraction whose condition mm -hmm. whose Lipschitz whose Lipschitz constant whose two over mu does not compatible with your step size. Yeah. Would that um, be yeah, you're bouncing around in that region, never jump up, J never jump up um, to, to some sort of more compatible region that you can gather. Minimizer, but you still stay there forever. Would that, would that be possible? Yeah. Um, that that is totally possible. So if we initialize around a very flat minimum, then of course the, the gradient descent will just uh, converge to that flat minimum. That is totally possible. Yeah. So all the experiment results reported here are uh, uh, initialized from some standard initialization like the uh, Xavier or her initialization. 
So, for, but 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 for instance, it, it may not really converge, right? It, it may say, for instance, the 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 number you're looking for is a two over, uh, two over L is some number, but you're choosing something like a bigger. So it will yeah. not converge, but it's just bouncing around in that in that in in that local region. Would that be possible? Um, not at all. I believe that is possible. I yeah, I believe that is possible. But uh, in most experiments that we see, actually, it uh, it does it does not bounce forever. But finally, it will settle down to somewhere around the minimum. Because because this, I mean, you sort of think about this can select the suitable region as long as that region whose two over L is compatible with your step size. But if you're stuck yeah. on some region, will never jump up. Then it's uh, you can you cannot select them. but the the stability um, the linear stability issue will uh, will drive the algorithm out of that region right because that region is unstable actually we have an exponential yeah, escape the, that is okay 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 all right okay okay thanks yeah but yeah but the reality but the true uh, case is actually more complicated sometimes yeah um, and many things can happen yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, yeah. I have a I have another question. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's related to to some thumbnails like sharpness in, in the literature because mm -hmm. my impression is like uh, the deterministic gradient or the full gradient descent uh, usually converge to some sharp solution, right? So yeah. the generalization is worse. Right. The as a gradient mass. But right. here and somehow you show if you have a larger learning rate, you can you can approach it to a sort of flat solution. Yeah. So the intuition here is uh, if you have, if you take a larger learning rate, then possibly you can find, or you should find flatter minimum. But one issue here is whether the gradient descent can still converge with a larger learning rate. If that happens, then it should find a flatter minimum. Okay. Okay. So if, if it converges, then you will get to some flatter yeah. solution. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. And another thing is, is uh, um, for your small learning rate, right? Mm -hmm. The small learning rate, of course, satisfy your 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 condition, like for around the sharp solution, right? Mm -hmm. But it also satisfy the the flat region, right? For that part, uh, you um, can like your Hessian, right? The the, the, the largest the... Like matter, right? Is is small, right? So that learning rate also satisfy that condition, right? Uh, you mean which one? You mean the the leftmost column here? Yeah. For example, your area is small. When area is small, yeah, right. Of course, it satisfy like the condition like your two mm -hmm. divided by the maximum eigenvalue of your Hessian, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then why it doesn't uh, approach to that? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we actually, I'm not sure about this. Yeah. When the learning rate is small. Sometimes we have we find global minimum, minimum that is flatter than uh, than that predicted by the theory. Yeah, you can see the fifty three here as compared to the two hundred. Uh, I think maybe that's because now the learning rate is too small, and actually it's we don't have that many very sharp minimum. That's possible, but I don't have a, a, a well established reason for this. <laughs> Well, no, no, but but, but the, the solution, the sharpness of solutions, yeah. that has nothing to do with your learning rate, right? The sharpness of solution has nothing to do my, with my learning rate, yes. But um, actually, we have many solutions. Right, and right. We have many flat and sharp ones. And uh, given the learning rate, I will pick those um, solutions that, that, are, that are stable, so whose sharpness should lie below some upper bound. In this table is like some solution you found by this G yeah. with a given learning rate, right? Yeah, right. Then you measure the sharpness of the solution it finds. Right. Yeah. Right. Then yeah, it's a little, it's a little surprising. Somehow, in average, right, it it, it more frequently finds the sharp solution. Yeah. Right. So, um. I think maybe one intuition here is we just have more sharp ones than the flat ones. So um, given- Oh, you uh, have a, more sharp, okay, okay, I see. Given a, a certain learning rate and you're, you're more likely to find those 
sharp ones, but you should be stable, right? So okay, I see. Uh, find that we find sharp ones that is close to the edge of stability. Oh, okay, 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 that's possible. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, so um, after the experiment here, we just did some extension of the linear stability theory to high order stability. So I will just uh, quickly quickly go through this page. This page is just a, a technical preparation for some uh, some con uh, conclusions later. But generally, if we consider uh, the stability of the high order tensor product of our linearized uh, dynamics, we can make a similar definition and we can have the following readout. That is, if we have k's order linearly stable at w star, then um, this 2k norm of the gradient at all the training that I xi should be upper bounded by a quantity of the batch size b and the learning rate eta. Later, we'll know how to use this readout. Okay, uh, come to a brief summary. We use the linear stability theory to show that, that SGD can select flat and a uniform minimum. And we know that there is a general observation believed by many people that flat minimum generalized better. So it seems if we connect these two together, we will, we will say that if we want to find better generalization, we just let SGD, uh, we just uh, pick like a larger learning rate or smaller batch size for SGD so that it can uh, pick flatter and more uniform minimum, then it may generalize better. And um, empirically, sometimes, yeah, we can, uh, we can observe that. But we want to ask a question that whether the second statement flat minimum generalized better is true. And if it is true, why is that? Here we want to provide a theoretical picture to understand this problem from a structure of neural networks, which is the multiplicative structure. Just look at a fully connected neural network with L layers like this. The structure we'll use is just this at W1 times X. So it just says um, after the input X is fed into the network, it is first to be multiplied with a parameter matrix W1 before fed into any nonlinearity. So this is a very common property for almost all neural network models. We can write it into this recurrence form, HI, HL is the, um, the output of L's layers. So H1 is sigma times W1X. This is the multiplicative, multiplicative structure. What does this tell us? Um, under this structure, if we consider the output of um, the model f as a function of the input x and the parameter w, if we take a gradient with respect to w1, we'll get this long term given by the chain rule times x transpose. Well, because after the chain rule, we have this w1x and we take a gradient with respect to w1, we get x. But what about we take a gradient with x? We get the same chain long readout given by chain rule, but multiplied with w1 transpose. These two gradients are very similar, but just uh, the same long term multiplied with a different term. So we can build some connection between these two uh, quantities. If we take a two norm of the x derivative, we'll see that it can be upper bounded by the two norm of the w1 derivative. Uh, of course, multiplied with this con uh, this coefficient regarding the norm of w1 and x, and that means as long as our first term uh, first layer parameter is not too large, the input data is not too small, then the smoothness of this function, uh, the the model function represented by neural network, um, can be upper bounded by the smoothness of the mod uh, of the neural network function in the parameter space. So in another word, the input space smoothness can be bounded by the parameter space smoothness. And the right-hand side, the parameter space smoothness, of course, is connected with the loss landscape. It is just a loss landscape. And the right side, it concerns like how fast the, the um, function represented by the neural network change. And you may imagine that if it changes slowly, mildly, then we may have a better generalization. Let's try to build some intuitions here. Why is that? Um, because the two quantities, the parameter w1 and x, are multiplied. And now if we consider our function f as a, a function of joint, parameter, uh, joint variables x and w, then because they are first multiplied and then fed into uh, um, any other operations, 
the level sets of this joint function uh, of the function in this joint space are a family of hyperbolas, right? And now at a um, specific x and a specific w, if we fix x and move w, we get this vertical line. And the slice of this uh, joint landscape on this vertical line actually is our landscape in the parameter space because we fix x but change w. On the other hand, if we fix w while change x, we get this horizontal line. And the slice of the landscape along this horizontal line actually is our input space landscape. That is a function represented by the, function, uh, by the network as an input of x. And these two landscapes are connected because this hyperbola level sets connect pairs of points on these two lines. So the landscape on these two lines shouldn't be very different. They should be pretty similar and the 3D um, illustrations here. And that is why we can try to use the parameter space landscape to control the input space landscape. And is that true? In practice, we also did some experiments on uh, different neural network models and different data sets. And after training the network to a global minimum, we measure two quantities. The first GW is the parameter space uh, smoothness we consider the gradient with respect to parameters at all training data and take a, and take a norm. And gx is the input space smoothness. We consider the gradient with respect to x at all training data and take a norm. And we see that these quantities, these two quantities have a strong correlation in the cases that we tested. And that means these two quantities are really, uh, really correlated, connected. And the gw can really control the gx. Okay, we can make some theory on this, um, given some assumptions about the smoothness of the loss function. Um, we can build a bound uh, that bounds the Sobolev seven norm of the function as an uh, as a func of the model as a function of input x, and this Sobolev seven norm is no longer evaluated at all the training data, but it is in a neighborhood of training data here. This x delta is a set, which is a delta neighborhood of all training data. So here, what we do is for this function, fxw star um, understood as a function of w, we evaluate the 2k norm of its gradient on x delta. And we see we can show that this 2k norm, uh, actually it's a sublef seminorm norm of f, can be upper bounded by a quantity regarding um, the its smoothness in the parameter space. So here we can see uh, an average of the gradient norm, uh, gradient norm, and the gradient is taken with respect to the parameters. Okay, and this result here, uh, this term here may seem familiar because we have seen this before. Here, so by the stability theory, linear stability theory, we can uh, bound this parameter space smoothness with a quantity related with the batch size and learning rate. And now we can connect the, it with our result here. <laughs> and this can help us bound the, um, the sublet seminorm of the model function using the hyperparameters of SGD given the linear stability of SGD and some other assumptions. And we can build a generalization bound with this result the idea is SGD controls the parameter space smoothness and the parameter space smoothness controls the input space smoothness and the input space smoothness is related with the gradient uh, with the generalization error. So under some assumptions or some conditions, we can show that the generalization error at W star, which is a stable global minimum, can be upper bounded by some quantity related with the learning rate and the batch size. Again, how to, imp uh, how to interpret this readout? This readout means picking a certain batch size and learning rate. If I can find a stable minimum under this set of hyperparameters, then this minimum should have um, some good generalization error. Okay, uh, a brief summary about this first section. We um, use the linear stab stability readout to show that SGD um, have a regularization effect for the, um, 
the parameter space gradient of the model function. And the parameter space smoothness can also regularize the uh, input space uh, smoothness because of the multiplicative structure of neural networks. There are several uh, open questions that we haven't explored, but it's interesting. For example, we uh, don't know what happens when W star is not an interpolation solution. That is when, it, when S W star, the loss value is not exactly zero, but some value larger. Or what happens when the loss is not square loss, for example, if it is cross entropy, or what happens when the optimizer is not SGD, but something else. And the second question is, the multiplicative structure actually is, uh, it appears in every layer and not only in the first layer. In every layer, we always multiply a matrix of parameter with the, um, the input from the previous layer. And is there more uh, implicit regularization effect induced by these many multiplicative structures that we can say? And the third one is just a technical thing that uh, I will skip it. Okay, so um, so far we studied the um, global minimum selection effect of uh, optimization algorithms using a static perspective. It means we just consider the properties of the gradient descent. And by the properties of the gradient descent, we, we say that um, the, the algorithm can converge to this global minimum, uh, uh, the global minimizer, and it cannot converge to that global minimizer. Um, but we don't know the process or the, 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 the procedure that this algorithm converge to this minimizer or, don't, or diverge from that one. And in the second part the, of this talk, I will talk about some dynamical study of the implicit bias. That is, we study how the optimization algorithms um, explore along a manifold of different minimizers. So in this, in this case, we can not only say um, it can select this type of minimizer, not select others, but we can also say how does it move from the neighborhood of this global minimum to the neighborhood of that one. So let's consider a simple case. The question is, we have a minimum manifold, a manifold formed by minima. And if we have an optimizer uh, moving around that minimum manifold, does the optimizer move from one minimum to another along this manifold? So does it explore along the manifold? And the answer is yes. We will see this uh, phenomenon in this very simple example. Consider a two-dimensional uh, function fxy equals to hx times y square, and hx is just a one plus x square. So um, whenever when y equals to zero, um, we get a global minimum of this function. So the global minimum of this function form a manifold, which is just exactly the x-axis. And we consider an SGD that minimizes this function. And here we will use SDE to approximate this SGD. Um, it is a standard practice to use as, uh, stochastic, differential, stochastic differential equations to approximate SGD. If we have an SGD like this, we can approximate its uh, trajectories by an SD dx equals to negative gradient fx dt plus uh, square root eta times some, uh, some gradient noise covariance. And in some cases around the global minimum, we can show that this covariance sigma aligns with the Hessian of f. So sigma is a proportional, is approximately proportional to the Hessian of f. Um, it is shown in this related work um, so we'll consider such a case. Of course, this is not necessary in our theory, but it is, uh, it helps uh, the visualization. We'll consider an SDE whose noise covariance is the um, Hessian of the loss function on the minimum manifold. And if we consider such an SDE and simulate this SDE on the uh, function, loss function above, what will happen? This is the um, contour plot of this loss function. We'll see that on the x-axis, we have a whole manifold of minimum, but the sharpness around this minimum can change. Um, it is, uh, we get a flattest minimum at 0, 0, and while uh, if the minimum move away from 0, then we get sharper and sharper minimum. Now we initialize the SDE from 5, 0, which is itself a, a minimizer but it is a sharp minimizer. 
And what will happen if we evaluate this SD? We will see that, firstly, of course, it will oscillate uh, on the vertical direction because of the gradient noise is on the vertical direction. But in the same process, it will move slowly leftward from the neighborhood of the sharp, uh, uh, sharp minimum to the neighborhood of flat minimum. And finally, stops at um, somewhere around 0, 0, oscillate around 0, 0, which is the flattest minimum. So why this will happen? Um, this figure on the right is a simple illustration. We have a bunch of level sets like this. And every time when we take a gradient, the gradient direction is, uh, is perpendicular to the level set. This is actually is the negative gradient direction. And this gradient direction can point upwards or downwards. Um, but it also has a small component pointing leftwards because the uh, landscape is going from sharp to flat. So there's always a small component, very small component that points leftward. But this small component is consistent across all the gradient evaluations. So on the vertical direction, we have a lot of cancellation. We go up and down, up and down. But on the horizontal direction, we always go leftward slowly. That is why during this oscillation, the SGD will explore along the minimum manifold and move from a sharp minima to flat minima. And our next theoretical question is, can we characterize this motion on the minimum manifold? Can we, can we know, answer the question like how fast it moves and in what direction it moves if our minimum manifold is not aligned, but uh, maybe a general higher dimensional manifold? And we can do this by a quasi-static derivation of an effective dynamics on the minimum manifold. Here, let's look at um, the same dynam the same SDE above, but here I just write it into a, a, a coupled system of X and Y. And in the X dynamics, we have a YT square term here. And in the Y dynamics, we have a YT term here. And we, are co we consider the case when our iterator is very close to the minimite. That means y is small. And when y is small, y squared is much smaller than y. So in this dynamics, actually, the x dynamics is much slower than the y dynamics. So what about let's be extreme and consider that um, the y dynamics so fast than the x dynamics so that uh, actually it is infinitely faster and it is at the equilibrium given any x. <clears throat> That means instead of considering the dynamics on the left, let's consider the one on the right. At any t, given x t, y tau is at the equilibrium of this dynamics fixing x t. And we will plug this equilibrium back into the dynamics of x. Then we can um, solve this so-called quasi-static dynamics because the y dynamics here is um, just the uh, einstein ullenbach an SD and we can solve the expectation of y tau square when tau goes to infinity and plug that back into the x equation, we get the following ODE for x. We can see that the movement of x is just a negative eta sigma square h prime xt over 4. So this eta is a linear rate. Sigma is just some, some constant here. Uh, it's, it's not important. <laughs> but what is important here is the h prime. So h prime here means our x along the manifold is actually doing a gradient descent, minimizing the h of x. And h of x is the one appearing here in our loss function. It characterizes how flat our minimum is. The smaller h is, the flatter the minimum is. So actually, this is how this, this SGD um, moves or explores along the minimum manifold and finding for search for flatter minima starting from sharper ones. And this is the uh, effective dynamics that it conducts on the manifold. OK, we can, um, that is a simple illustration for um, two dimensional case. And we can extend our derivation um, to a general loss function with a general smooth uh, minimum manifold M. And what we did is to consider a quadratic, a, pro, a quadratic expansion of function around M in a tubular space of the manifold M. And we also consider, we still consider an SGD. 
uh, approximated by an SDE. And in the, in the assumption that the um, noise covariance is proportional to the Hessian of the loss function, we can get the following effective manifold dynamics, which is instead of minimizing um, H of X, now the H of X becomes a Hessian matrix. So we minimize the trace of this Hessian matrix on the manifold. This is the result of our derivation. Um, and our derivation can be applied to other um, more general cases, for example, other noise covariance instead of Hessian, and also other algorithms like SGD with momentum and also Adam. But we um, aim to provide a, a general way to derive the manifold dynamics. We didn't provide a, a strict mathematical proof that the resulting dynamics is indeed um, a perfect approximation of the uh, the true behavior of optimizers. To see a mathematical proof for a simple case, um, we can check this work by uh, Sanjeev Varora's group. Okay, this is um, some numerical experiment showing that our derived uh, dynamics and um, manifold dynamics is really um, accurate, accurate tra accurately track the true behavior of optimizers for SGD and SGDM. I will skip this. Okay, and what I want to talk more is a very interesting result we derived for Adam using our um, quasi-static approach. And, and the conclusion here for Adam is the speed of manifold dynamics depends on the direction of the manifold. It is um, not the case for SGD or SGD momentum because those algorithms are rotationally invariant. Um, if we keep the, if we fix the loss landscape, but just uh, rotate the whole configuration, nothing will change. But for Adam, things will change a lot. Uh, we can see that by this experiment, we consider rotating uh, h of x times y, times y square by theta. So now our uh, manifold has an angle theta with the x axis. Then the um, effective exploration dynamics of atom along the manifold will change with respect to theta. When theta is zero, the atom moves very fast. This uh, vertical ax uh, axis is the distance to the flattest uh, um, to the flattest minimum. We start from five, so we'll finally move to zero. Um, when theta is zero, atom very fast. But when we gradually in increase theta, atom gets slower and slower. And when theta gets to 30, 45 degrees, the exploration of atom on the minimum manifold is pretty slow. You can compare it with this dash line showing SGD. It is slower than SGD. And the reason is th of that can be unveiled by uh, a quasi-static derivation using an SDE for atom recently derived by uh, in, a pre uh, in a related work. And um, Using this SD, we conducted a quasi-static derivation, and we showed that when theta equals to zero, the manifold dynamics of Adam is uh, like x dot. Uh, the the speed of x is proportional to h prime of x over epsilon square root of h x, and when theta equals to forty five degrees, we have this. We don't have that epsilon on the bottom, so this epsilon. <laughs> If you are familiar with the atom scheme, it is epsilon is just a small quantity added on the denominator to avoid division by zero. So this epsilon is very small. That means when theta is zero, we get a very fast um, manifold dynamics. But while when theta is um, not close to zero, this dynamics is slower. OK, in the last part, um, we have built some results and, and intuitions about the optimization algorithms exploration along minimum manifold. And we want to use that picture to explain some, um, some um, real observations or real phenomena observed in the, uh, in the practice. And, and we consider the edge of stability phenomenon, which is a phenomenon that people observe that um, the gradient descent when it trains a neural network it usually happens in an edge of stability. That is, firstly, we have a, a sharp drop of the loss value. And later, the loss becomes to decrease very slowly. And in the same time, at the same time, if we consider the sharpness of, um, of the loss landscape at our parameter, we'll see that the sharpness will first increase 
and then oscillate around the edge of sharpness. That is just a, a two over eta. And we try to attempt to um, explain that um, by this picture. So the first stage, the quick drop of the training loss is, is the process that we start from our initialization and find uh, a minimum manifold and settles down around the minimum manifold. And the second process, the slow drop and the address stability is the process that the optimizer explores along the minimum manifold. <laughs> Um, this can explain why the, the loss is dropping gradually, but there is one gap. The gap is, in the previous analysis, we assume that our loss function can be quadratically expanded ar along, around the uh, minimum manifold. And if this quadratic expansion is true, then if we run a gradient descent around the minimum manifold, note that here it is gradient descent, it is not SGD, then the GD will either converge pretty fast or just diverge. The behavior is similar to, um, to um, optimizing a, a quadratic function, a simple quadratic function with gradient descent. So the question is, what can, uh, why the gradient descent can keep oscillating and move along the minimum manifold in this case? There must be something different in reality. So we did some exploration um, to, uh, on, the, on the real loss landscape of um, practical neural network models. The visualization we did is illustrated like this. Um, pick any point around the minimum manifold. We consider the gradient direction. And we, cons we visualize the loss value along this slice given by the gradient direction. We'll get something like this, right? Maybe we, uh, this is our starting point, which is on the wall of the, um, of the manifold. And here is the bottom of the manifold. And here is the second wall. This is just a simple illustration. But what happens if we do this visualization for practical neural network models? We did that for several different models like VGG, ResNet, or DenseNet on different data sets. And the first row shows some result of our visualization. And we see that these loss landscapes, these are one dimensional slice of the loss landscape, are pretty convex. But actually, they are not quadratic. We can see that by computing the second finite difference of these curves, and we see that for a quadratic function, these second finite difference should be a constant, but here they are not constant. Um, we, get, we get the highest second finite difference at or around the minimum, and this difference gets smaller when we move away from the minimum. That means this function actually, it grows slower than a quadratic function. And we call this a quadratic, uh, subquadratic growth phenomenon. And this subquadratic growth phenomenon can help us um, explain the edge of stability using our manifold, minimum manifold exploration picture. The case is, the, the, what happens is this. If we have a subquadratic function, then run a gradient descent with certain large learning rate. The gradient descent um, will not diverge and will not converge, but it will also it will oscillate at somewhere. As shown here, if we start from here using a large learning rate, the gradient descent will not converge, but it will also not diverge. It will converge to a periodic solution. That is because the higher we get, actually the uh, flatter the landscape is. So we have somewhere to be stable. We don't need to blow up all the way to infinity. So. Um, if we look at this um, loss value plot, uh, starting from some large learning rate, we uh, quickly stabilize at somewhere. And if we now dropped the learning rate to a smaller level, then um, our iterator gets lower. And later, it also it again stabilizes at some level, becomes oscillating. <laughs> and finally, if we drop the learning rate further and make it small enough, then uh, we can converge. This is the normal direction of the minimum manifold. Now, if we consider a manifold of minimum, on the normal direction that we have that uh, subquadratic growth, then what will happen for gradient descent? Firstly, on the normal direction, gradient descent will oscillate at some level, depending on its learning rate. And in this process, we'll have a small driving force pointing to the flatter uh, minimum the same reason as the uh, illustration given several pages before. 
So while the gradient descent uh, iterator oscillates, it will slowly move towards flatter minima. And in this process, we can show that this range of oscillation gets smaller and smaller, and that will give us a gradually slowly decreasing loss value. <laughs> so this is our explanation, and we can have some theory characterizing the effective dynamics in some specific cases. Okay, a summary of this section is we treat the problem um, of finding the exploration dynamics of optimization algorithms on minimum manifold. And our approach is a quasi-static derivation given a separation of speed. And we can apply this approach to many different uh, algorithms like SGD, SGDM, and Atom, and also for GD under subquadratic growth. And that is our observation. We observe a subquadratic growth phenomena and we use that to explain the edge of stability. And in the paper, not in this talk, we also studied the origin of the subquadratic growth. We, we show that this can be caused by uh, the different magnitudes in the training data. And the open question is, in practice, um, we don't know, can we uh, design an algorithm with fast manifold dynamics using the intuition built just now? OK, uh, that's all about my talk. Um, what we did here is we take a static perspective to study the linear stability of SGD, and we also study uh, why flat minimum generalized better using a, a multiplicative structure perspective. And we take a dynamical perspective on optimizers' movement along the minimum manifold, and we use that to study different algorithms and some um, practical phenomena. And these are the related papers um, of the contents of this talk, and these are my collaborators. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sal, so much for this very, very interesting talk. Uh, any questions?